I just watched an interview with Rand Miller, one of the two brothers behind Myst. He mentioned in the interview that Myst is slightly better on a Mac than on a PC. Today we are going to restore a Power Macintosh 6100 from 1994 and try out original Myst on real vintage hardware. The 6100 was Apple's first computer with a PowerPC processor, created by IBM and Motorola. This is a pretty cool machine, but the real gem here is the Apple Multiple Scan 20 inch Trinitron display. Don't know how well it shows up on camera, but it's an absolute beast. The Pizza Box Mac is clearly designed to have a display on top of it, but if we put this monster on top of the 6100, I'm pretty sure it will crush it. Myst came out in 1993. The Mac and the display were released in 1994, so it's a pretty close match. My old sticker here actually says black screen, so we may have to fix it too. The cover for the CD on the front and the piece at the back are quite fragile on these machines, but the case itself isn't too bad. My only concern are these tabs at the back. So when I remove the case on these machines, I put my hand on top and then gently lift on the tab. That way I don't apply excessive force on the tab. And when these two tabs are released, we can just pull the lid off. These machines are toolless. You only need tools to remove the power supply and the motherboard. So to remove the SCSI drive, just remove the cables and then push on this tab and the hard drive will come out. And this drive has been replaced because it's from 1998. Same thing with the CD-ROM drive. The CD-ROM is dated 1995, so that's probably when this machine was manufactured. To remove the diskette drive, we have to lift the shield off first, then pull on these tabs. The power supply is held in place with just one screw, and then we can remove it by pushing it forward and up. The power supply is dated 1994 and made by Aztec. Next we need to remove the ribbon cable for the diskette drive the speaker cable and the power LED. The motherboard is held in place with two screws. This screw here and one screw hidden inside this standoff. So what do you guys think? Will this withstand the weight of that massive display? Probably not. And uh, now we can actually remove the motherboard. To remove the drive cage, we have to pull on this tab here and then gently lift at the back and push on the tab. Same thing on this side. One tab to lift here and then push the cage back and it will come off. Underneath the cage there is a small speaker. I'm going to wash all the bits and pieces off camera, so I need to make a complete disassembly. And here's the ribbon cable for the diskette drive and the power LED. I'm not aware of a safe way to remove the plastic feet, so I'm gonna leave them in. Luckily they haven't yellowed, so that's okay. Same thing at the back here. The most difficult thing when restoring a 6100 is to remove this cover without breaking it. Luckily this cover hasn't yellowed, so I'm just gonna leave it in. Inside the case we have a date, August of 1994. Unfortunately I'm not sure if we caught this one on time. The caps are leaking and there is some corrosion on these legs. A lot more corrosion here on what I think is the sound chip. Same thing on this connector here. You can clearly see some corrosion on the pins. So I'm not sure about this one, but let's try and see if we can save it. So first, let's remove all the modules. And if you push on these tabs here, 
the heat sink will come off. Underneath the heat sink we have a PowerPC 601. The CPU is running at 60 MHz, but these machines were also available running at 66 MHz. That IBM logo looks so weird inside a Macintosh. The next thing we need to do is to have a look inside the power supply. We need to make sure the caps inside here are OK. Can't see any dust in the fan. That's a good sign. Now let's see how we can get inside here. Okay. Well, it's very clean. Extremely clean. So I'd say this Mac hasn't been used much. I'll do a proper inspection. Well, I checked and sure enough, this power supply is clean as new. There are no bulging caps, no refuss, and no signs of leakage. So either this machine hasn't seen much use, or this power supply has been replaced. I couldn't tell it apart from a brand new power supply. Well, in that case, the next step is to neutralize the corrosion. And I found another chip here, with some heavy corrosion on it. So I'm going to apply some white vinegar for a few minutes before I do the proper wash. Uh, this is pretty gross. I have been inside quite a few of these machines. And this is the first machine that I have found with leaky caps. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like this for a few minutes. And then I'm going to wash all the parts. The largest display I have ever restored was a 17 inch display. So this display is way larger. That may not sound like a big difference. But it is. Luckily I found a service manual online for this display. Apparently we should remove the back cover without removing the stand. It's a bit of a struggle. And I am of course just using a very soft prying tool to avoid scratching it up. And here comes the back cover. Well, as expected. We've got spiders and dust. And here's the main reason why this is worth the hassle. We've got a sticker here that says Sony Trinitron for the best gaming experience. Well, I've been very lucky lately with very clean displays with low mileage. But this display is going to make up for all of those projects. As I take this apart, crap is falling out. Weirdly enough, there are what looks like sunflower seeds inside this display. So what the heck are they doing inside here? And the spiders inside this machine look like they have escaped from Jurassic Park. I'm actually cleaning with a hoover as I go. Okay, let's see if we can remove this shield. Well, that is actually not a lot of soot. But still, it's going to need quite a lot of cleaning. According to the service manual, weirdly enough, the next thing to come off is the front bezel. And the stand should still be left in place. Well, I'm just gonna trust the manual and remove that front bezel. And I think it should come off now. Well, the connector for the cable that connects the control panel isn't accessible yet. So I think I'm going to have to remove the entire control panel and then detach it from the main PCB later. So let's give that a try. And yeah, that worked. And there is an accessible connector here. So that worked out well. And this PCB is made by Sony too. So it's not just a tube. Well, the service manual is jumping back and forth quite a bit. But let's try to remove the stand now. And yes, it came off. Uh, this is disgusting. Inside the stand here, there's an ADB board. I guess you could call it an ADB hub. Next we have the neck board. I'm sure these connectors are coded. But I'm taking pictures just to be sure. You could easily crack that neck when removing connectors from the neck board if you use too much force. So better to use some tools. And the usual disclaimer applies of course. Please don't poke around inside CRT displays or power supplies. 
They may contain dangerous voltages, even with the cord unplugged. The snake board seems to be held in place with one screw. That is a first for me. Okay, I think it's free now. Let's see if we can remove it. There are two more cables and they are now accessible, but not easily. In fact, this cable here doesn't have a connector at all. Well, there are so many connectors, so I'm skipping ahead a bit here. But now the neckboard is off. Well, it's absolutely disgusting. But as you can see, there isn't much soot in this display. So if we can clean it up and make it work, we should be able to get a really good image. Okay, next up we have the power supply. And it's on a separate board on the side of the display. And here comes the power supply. This is one of those projects. You know, if I had known how disgusting this display was, I would never have taken on this project. Uh, now it's kind of too late, so I might as well fix it. So, I think the main PCB is pretty much free now. Apart from a few connectors that aren't quite accessible yet. There are so many connectors and cables in this display. Probably four or five times more than in any other display I have worked on. And some of them are really hard to reach. And pretty stuck. I think that was the last connector. Not quite. One more here. By the way, I couldn't confirm it, but I think this is basically a Sony Multiscan 20SC2. Slightly customized and redesigned for Apple. I tend to use the stolen expression. If you're playing along, then consider this or consider that or whatever. But in this case, I'm pretty sure nobody's crazy enough to play along in this project. Okay, I think the bezel is more or less free now. Aside from this ground strap, normally you wouldn't remove this bezel. But in this case, absolutely every single piece of this display needs a bath. And there actually is a tiny amount of soot here on this plastic cover. So at least we know it's used, but not much. And for the hardcore fanboys, this tube is an M49KZK16X. And made in Japan, of course. I know I'm repeating myself, but this tube is just enormous. So here it is for comparison, side by side with my smallest Sony Trinitron. And aside from being huge, it's also incredibly heavy. That is a big chunk of glass. At this point, it started to smell really bad in the studio. So I had only two things to choose from. Either take this display to e-waste, or give it a shower. I normally would dry clean the tube, but in this case I had nothing to lose. If I can't make it smell nice again, it's e-waste. I don't really know the story behind the Sony, but I suspect it was trash picked. Anyways, the stench is gone now. In fact, it smells like apples in here. How about that? An apple that smells apples. Okay, let's see if we can fix that black screen. So these leaky caps are 47 micro 16 volts. Oh man, it smells fishy right away. Let's see if they will come off without some fresh solder and flux. It did. Nasty fishy smell. There's still some electrolyte underneath that cap. Or perhaps not. That may actually be glue. I think it is. And it's really stuck. Let's see if it will come off with some heat. And I'm going to reflow all the components that has some corrosion on them. Some fresh solder. And tons of flux. And hopefully this chip here hasn't been damaged. Uh, 
and the glue does come off with some heat. This may not be necessary. Almost remove that component by accident. I better hold it down. But I think it will prevent the board from further corrosion. And now let's clean those pads with some good old wick. I think those pads are okay, so maybe we're lucky here. Let's clean that flux off and make an inspection. Well, that looks pretty good to me. Yes, I think we're okay. Let's add a splash of solder to one of the pads. And a nice and fresh cap. I even think I managed to order the right size this time. These are a bit trickier because they are very close to this plastic connector here. So let's shield that connector off with a box cutter blade. And more fishy smell. One good thing about these boards is that all the electrolytic caps have the same value. And there are 11 of these on the board. These pads look alright too. Um, we've got some more corrosion on these ram chips. So I better reflow those legs. Uh, apparently my TS100 is about to give up. It keeps turning itself off. Yeah, these pads are fine. So if you've got one of these machines, now is the time to recap it. Left unattended, the caps will eventually destroy the board. If they haven't already done so, the only way to find out is to replace these caps and turn the machine on. As you can see, the legs on the chip here are corroded too. We better reflow them too. And hope for the best. I'll just drag solder these and then remove the excess solder. Yeah, some of those pads don't look too good. Let's try with some more flux. Yeah, that looks much better. Still not quite shiny. Let's try that again. Yeah, that's much better. Nice and shiny pads and uh, legs. So how about these pads? Well, the solder on this pad here won't come off. Let's try with some more flux. No, that solder just won't melt. Well, let's try with some more flux. The largest tip I have, 400C and tons of fresh solder. Well, that still took a while, but I think it's coming off now. Well, that sure took a while, but it finally came off. Yes, those pads look fine now. But now I have a crap load of flux to clean up. And I need to check that chip. And make sure I didn't bridge it. Okay, I did an inspection. The legs on the chip looks fine. And these pads too. And unfortunately I think that TS100 is a goner. So now I have to keep changing the tip on the pine sill. Very annoying. Well, there's kind of a similar thing going on all over this board. The captures has corroded quite a few legs on the surrounding chips. So I'll do the same thing on this chip here and all the surrounding components and hope for the best. Okay, I skipped ahead here to the trickiest part because these caps are very close to some plastic parts. Uh, this is also the worst area. There's quite a lot of corrosion going on in this corner. Yeah, not much space here. But I think we did alright. Let's find out. Yeah, those connectors are still fine. But not much margins. So I'll clean up this area the best I can. Almost lost the resistor here while cleaning. Those pads were pretty nasty. Let's clean them up before we put that resistor back on. Better add some fresh solder to those pads too. Well, R15 isn't too happy to get back on that board. Let's see if some flux helps. I think it did, yes. I just noticed 
there are five tantalums in this area with the same value as the electrolytic caps. So I wonder why Apple mixed tantalums and electrolytic caps. Okay, that was the last cap. So I'll double check my work and then we'll try this board out. Okay, a couple of hours later and we've got a working test bench set up here. This is not the board we fixed. This is another machine. So working power supply, speaker and diskette drive. A 2x Apple branded CD-ROM drive. And I found a matching Connor drive with an Apple logo. So I replaced that IBM drive for this more period correct drive. I downloaded System 8.6 from Winworld PC. But unfortunately that CD-ROM doesn't boot. So I went for System 7.6.1 instead. Although I think System 8 is a better match. So I'll probably upgrade this machine later. I don't have an adapter for that weird graphics connector at the back. So I'm using this AV card and a tiny display that has yellow to perfection. So let's test our board and see if it works. But first a splash of heat paste on the CPU and a heat sink. A PRAM battery. I found two sticks of 32 meg RAM. And officially that's the most you can use on one of these boards. But unofficially it can take a lot more. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see if it works. Well, power LED lights up. The hard drive is making some noise. And the speaker is working. And the display came on. And we've got an image. Awesome. So not a black screen anymore. Let's see if it boots. I think it does. So pretty sure we have a working system now. By the way, it's installing system 761 from a 2x seed ROM. That took a while. Well, it's a bit slow to boot. So maybe I should try to find some more RAM. Let me see what the system requirements are for MIST. 4 megs of RAM. Well, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, we're up and running, so... I guess we'll try to install MIST. Ah, and I think it works. Awesome. Okay, great. So we have a working machine now. Time to reassemble that display. Okay, let's put back that frame. I obviously cleaned all the parts. Not just the tube. If you by any chance decide to go this extreme and wash the tube, don't scrub it, just rinse it, because that black paint is conductive and needs to stay on. Since there are a few corroded spots, I'm going to use Dioxid on all the connectors, just to make sure we don't have any issues with bad connections. Okay, let's get that base plate and the main PCB back on, and hopefully remember all the connectors. Luckily many of them are marked. And some of them I have marked. And some of them are easy to guess. And some connectors are coded. Okay, main PCB all hooked up. I think we need to put the neck board back on first, before the power supply. Because I don't think I will be able to reach this connector when the power supply is back on. I better tighten that neck board right away. I don't want that neck board to fall off. Yeah, this would be way too tight after we have installed the power supply. So many connectors. Let's get the oxid in all of them. And then we have these funky connectors for RGB. Never seen this type before. Yeah, this would be interesting to mix up. I'm checking with the images I took to make sure that everything gets hooked up correctly. And in the images, everything is so disgusting. That wash really made a huge difference. Okay, time to get that power supply back on. We're almost ready for a test. Time to get that stand back on. Well, I guess we better wipe that screen off before we do any tests. Well, for a moment, I thought we had a total fail here. And this display was on its way back to e-waste because this to me looks like water inside glass. But then I decided to have a look through the loop and I actually think that's glue. 
I'll do my best to record a close-up, the best I can, but I don't really have the equipment for it. And if anyone by any chance watching this has been working with manufacturing of CRT displays, please leave a comment below. It kind of looks like this piece of glass here is glued to the tube. I may be wrong here, but I think this outer piece of glass here is not part of the tube. It's a separate sheet of glass. Hopefully someone will comment and we will learn something new. But anyways, that gave me a scare. All that work for nothing. Well, I guess it could still be, because I don't actually know if it works. So the only thing left to connect before we can do a test is the control panel. Okay, we are ready for a test. Well, I have restored enough CRT displays not to get nervous when I do the power on test. But I'm gonna have to admit, there is some tension in the studio here. So, power connected, but not turned on. Fingers crossed. Well, I heard a click, and nothing exploded, and nothing is burning. So that's a good start. So let's try that power switch. Well, we've got high voltage. So everything seems okay so far. Let's connect that display to the Mac. Okay, Mac hooked up. Let's turn the display on first. We've got high voltage. So let's turn that Mac on. I think it's turning on. It's making some noises. Oh yes. I think it works. Image is way off. Now this is probably flickering like crazy on camera. I need to get a fancy camera for the channel, but they are crazy expensive. So that is going to take a while. Well, the image is too wide, but it looks very stable. Well, here's the reason why it flickers. I can only choose between 67 and 75 Hz. My camera just can't sync to these odd values. The display will do 60, and probably a lot more than 75, but I can't choose that in System 7. Wonder if there's a software that would allow me to choose whatever frequency I want. Anyways, at 11.52, the image is superb here in real life. The closest I can go with my camera is 40. So the flickering is sort of gone, but I've got some nasty banding instead. Well, this is actually hilarious, because my LED lights in the background can't sync to this speed either. <laughs> so apparently this Sony was left to die without having been used much. Who does that? This display was silly expensive when it was new. So, but to play this game... I'm gonna set the display to 256 colors and 640, 480 at 67 hertz. Next I took care of the display case. Unfortunately it had cracked really badly in the front bezel. This piece here had come off completely. I glued it back on and then covered all cracks with glue and baking soda. From experience I know for sure this will hold up fine. The hydrogen peroxide has done its job well too. The case has a few scratches, but the color looks original again. So let's have a look at Myst. Well, I don't remember much of it, aside from it being a very good looking game. Seeing it again now, my memory is correct. The graphics are gorgeous. It's a very slow paced game, so probably unbearable for the TikTok generation. I only had half an hour to try it out before uploading this video. And nothing much has really happened yet. But that doesn't discourage me at all. I don't mind spending some time in this beautiful fantasy world. The CD-ROM drive is a bit noisy and unfortunately a bit slow. I wonder if there is a software for System 7, similar to Demon Tools. That would definitely improve the gaming experience on this machine. By the way, if you like this type of content, let me know with a thumbs up. Well, we're not done yet, because I have two of these machines. The interesting thing about the other 6100 is that it came with a DX266. Yeah, you heard that right. This Mac will run DOS and Windows. That means we can compare this game with the DOS version on the same machine. Hit the bell icon below and set it to all if you want to join me in that video too. And now is a good time to watch the restoration and repair video, where we'll restore the smallest Sony Trinitron I have. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. You guys are great. Thank you for your support. 
If you would like to become a supporter of this channel too, you will find the link in the description. Thank you for watching, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment. It helps me grow the channel and make more videos like this one.